Hello and welcome to Boothcast. This Boothcast is brought to you by Booth Training. Um, it's an online paddling solution. So if you want to get out there, get better, get fit, get healthy, I'll be out there to uh, help you reach your goals and, and make you that much better of a paddler. So if you want to find out more, check out michael-booth.com.au. Um, today's guest on Boothcast is Anthony Bella, all the way from Dana Point in California. I think that's where he lives. He's around there. So we'll just say he's from Dana <laughs> California. He is um, the first ever Carolina Cup winner, which is like, obviously means a lot to me considering I've chased that around for a while over the past few years. He had involvement in surf life saving. He did physical education for a while, but has been a part of stand up paddling basically since the beginning. And it's going to be so cool to sort of dive into his background and, walk through a lot of the stand-up history as well. So, Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. My pleasure and honor, Michael. Excited to uh, have a chat with you. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, where it all started for you? So where are you from? Uh, where did you grow up? All that type of stuff. So I grew up inland in a little town called Walnut. And uh, I, I started swimming competitively at the age of four. It was kind of like uh, like cheap babysitting, you know, for my family. They always knew where I was going to be after school. I would just go to go to swim training every day since um, I was four. I have an older brother, he's three years older, so we'd we'd go to school and then go to swim practice. And um, you know, I, I lived like I said, I lived inland. We had a pool in our backyard, and I had this neighbor who I think was like a pro, semi pro surfer, and um, he he'd given us some boards. So I learned how to surf like running off the, the edge of the pool deck and jumping on the surfboard. And, and then, you know, as I got older, our swim team would, would go to Huntington Beach every Wednesday. So that was like, you know, a cool thing. And, you know, I remember seeing like the junior lifeguards running around Huntington. I'm like, oh, man, that would be so cool. But I lived an hour away. Um, I always loved the beach, but I just, you know, was, uh, you know, my parents didn't, you know, surf or anything like that. But they always encouraged and took me to the beach. So it started in the pool. Uh, both swimming competitively and in my backyard pool. And then, you know, as I got older, I just kind of got draw drawn more and more to the ocean. And so you would start in swimming. Did you do competitive swimming or was it more for like a bit of fun or was it more just for babysitting to get rid of you out of the house? Uh, it started as that. And then, uh, you know, we I was a competitive swimmer, like swam in, in high school and, you know, a little bit in uh, junior college and swimming was, um, you know, basically, I from the time I was four until I graduated high school, um, I quit for a couple of years when I went on my skateboarding hiatus, and then uh, jumped back into swimming. So that's kind of where like, my foundation for all the sports, I mean, you know, like the discipline that it takes to, you know, swim year round, and I swam for a, um, you know, highly competitive club team where we had Olympians, you know, training in our club and things like that. So I've always been around like high level athletics. And I was I was you know, never like, you know, super national ranked, but, you know, I went to like our junior nationals and, and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, was, was a pretty decent swimmer and, and that kind of formed my, you know, my, my, my background in training, but also just my comfort in the ocean, you know, when you're swimming and practicing breath holding and things like that, it, 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 it's the only way to help by not being in the ocean sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. You've just got to make sure that you're doing in the water, just doing all sorts of different things. But can you tell us a little bit about your skateboarding hiatus? That's something that's actually <laughs> interest as you started talking about. What do you, what's that mean? Well, you know, swimming, it takes, it's not the kind of sport where you can like take a week off or take two weeks off. You really have to like, if you want to be a good swimmer, you know, there's those three to four meets every year that you're kind of peaking towards and you can't just like go on vacation or like, you know, go play with your friends after school or anything like that. So once I really started taking, taking it serious, you know, like early teens kind of thing, it was um, something that, you know, I, I, you, you, re you really can't have friends outside of your swimming friends. And yeah. so I was kind of just, you know, in that rebellious stage and I'd been swimming for so long and man, it's just so much chlorine and we lived inland and it was hot and like I have asthma and just some days it wasn't fun. And so I just, you know, started skateboarding and just, you know, I always loved board sports. And so this was like something new where I didn't have to drive to the beach or anything. So yeah, I had some skateboard friends in junior high school and then just started skating more. And, and I finally was like, you know, asked my parents if I could quit swimming. And um, so like for the first time in my life in junior high school, I, I quit swimming and I was just skateboarding a lot and, and uh, you know, doing whatever you do in junior high school. And, 
And then once I kind of got out of that, I went back and started high school. I went back to swimming and I'm like, oh, okay, this is like, you know, I, I, I really do enjoy it. So how good of a skater did you become? Were you doing like, I don't know, <laughs> indie flips and stuff or was it <laughs> a bit of fun and, and sort of like surfing around the, around the bowl? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I was, you know, I dreamed of doing those types of tricks, um, but I never really like had access to like good ramps. You know, so we'd we'd make launch ramps and stuff, and I'd build ramps with my friends, and and you know, I was you know can can get around a pool pretty pretty fun and safe, but I also like really didn't want to hurt myself too bad, so it was that fine juggling thing where uh, I did some pretty like you know we'd build ramps and then build a build like a finish like a launch ramp and then a landing ramp and space it out more and more, and you know I got to jump pretty hard you know pretty far and thought we were cool and had the old you know video cameras filmed ourselves a little bit but I was never like a really good skateboarder you know as far as like going on a vert ramp I surfed there's this uh, famous um, pool at the van skate park in Orange County called the combi and I've skated the combi you know a few times but I can't say that I could drop in in the deep deep section of the combi bowl but yeah man it would be awesome <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've never really got involved in skating because I was always too scared of hurting myself. So I was always like, <laughs> if I fall in the ocean, I'll be okay. So I always yeah. suck to say right away from skateboarding. I had the swimming thing in the background as well, similar to you. So I didn't want to get too injured because it was like six weeks out of swimming sort of thing if you broke your wrist. So it was always yep. a bit scary. But um, so you're, you're about 13, 14, I think at this stage, you start swimming a bit more competitively. When do you start getting involved in like the lifeguarding and the, the surf lifesaving, going over to Manly, all this stuff? So when I was uh, when I was in high school, uh, it's interesting because there's this uh, this 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 girl that swam on our swim team, and her her dad, a guy by the name of Gabe Campos, um, he was a lifeguard, and he would always tell me about LA County lifeguards. Oh man, you got to take this lifeguard test. You know, you're a swimmer, like you know, you know. And he would talk about you know the the pay, which is LA County lifeguards are one of the highest paid lifeguards, um, you know, in the the, the country, and so. I remember him just telling me, all you need is a driver's license and a high school diploma and you could be making, you know, 15 bucks an hour. And um, by, the, by the time I graduated, they had like a hiring freeze. And so I had to wait for a few years. But when I was 20 years old, I took the LA County lifeguard test. They hadn't had a test in three years. So it was like, uh, I mean, there were hundreds of people that went to this tryout and it was so intimidating because I never did junior guards. You know, I kind of knew the ocean a little bit, but not like, People are coming in with like, you know, UCLA swimming, USA swimming, all these different groups of people. And I just, you know, went by myself and it was, you know, just, you start off in this, you know, big room in Santa Monica and hundreds of people. And I ended up getting 10th in the lifeguards in the tryout swim. And then they put you through an interview. We went through eight, 10 hour days of training and I graduated first in, in the training academy and uh, I remember during the training academy, one of my friends, a guy by the name of Tim, Tim Gare, uh, who's won the Molokai race a couple of times and um, paddleboarding. And he's like, yeah, they have these ocean races. And I'd been doing good in our training academy and in some of the races, but he introduced me to like ocean racing and, you know, prone paddling. You know, I surfed, but didn't know about paddleboard races or anything. And so once I did like my first race, I was, I was hooked. I was like, oh man, this is cool. Cause you have the waves to factor in. It's not like swimming in a pool where it's like you mess up your flip turn or your streamline's not perfect. And so I was like hooked. It's the first race I ever did. I remember is in Ma Manhattan Beach, and I just like fell in love with ocean racing. And was it the the board paddling mainly that you did? Was that like sort of like coming from like surfing and and were you surfing a lot as a as a teenager as well? Or was that sort of like or you just swam and then gradually got involved in the ocean and then found the lifeguards? I liked surfing a lot. I just never, you know, got into a consistent routine because I live so far. Obviously, yeah. when I, you know, when I turned 16 and got a license, I would go as much as I can. But, you know, I'd be like a weekend warrior type of kid. I didn't like cut school to go surfing or anything. And uh, from where I lived in Walnut to Huntington, it was about an hour, you know, hour, yeah. 15 minutes door to door. So it wasn't like I could go before school or anything. So once I became an LA County lifeguard and you know, you get 72 miles of free parking that that really like just uh, uh, kind of propelled me forward in in the ocean racing and having access to the ocean to where I was going there for work anyway. 
So like my rookie year, my first year of lifeguarding, uh, my shifts, I had two 10 to sixes, two 12 to eights, and one 11 to seven. Whatever time I started, I was at the beach at seven in the morning and playing on, on the boards, on the surf skis, on all these new equipment. I mean, I, I, I knew how to paddle a little from surfing, but yeah. um, back then we were racing on 12 foot boards and trying to get those things through. And they weren't the good ones, like the Bennett racing boards. They were like the big logs that they give the rookies in the training academy. So learning how to paddle one of those was so daunting. I'll never forget the first day in the training academy, I, I, I like couldn't get the board through the surf and I'd get out and I was so frustrated. And then the next group would go and there'd be an extra board lying there. I'm like, hey, can I go again? Sure, go again. And then I kept going and going. And uh, like I said, uh, every day I was at the beach because I could be. And I, like, I felt like I was making up for lost time that I didn't have as a kid. And just like, you know, kept learning and progressing and, and, would, and started doing all the races. And even from that first year of lifeguarding, when we'd have, you know, a race or a carnival, I would do all of the events. I was, wasn't good in the board, but I would do it. I wasn't good at the ski, but I would do it. I was just learning how to ski paddle, but I would still do the Ironman race. So I had a full program from the first races that I started doing. And, and then, you know, you pick it up over the, you know, with, with the dedication and stuff. So I was hooked right away and I loved all the different craft and like trying to figure out how each one gets in and out of the surf. And man, it was, it was awesome. And in a, like in sort of like you're basically you're in LA and you're growing up in that environment is the beach in America, like through your era, was it like a, a big thing? Like did families get down to the beach on the weekends or it doesn't really seem like it's the same sort of culture somewhere like Australia where it's like the beach is sort of like the be all and end all and everyone lives by the coast and, and you're always, always going to the beach. But was it like that for you as a kid or was it just something that was very, very different to everyone else? You know, it's interesting because like, I feel like I, I, I almost fit in more with what I loved with the Australian culture more. It's like, you know, the, the, all, all the, the surf clubs, like everyone goes down on Sunday to do the Sunday swim. And then you've got all the different training squads that are going on. And there's, you know, nothing like that in, in LA. It's more like, you know, people go to the beach to, you know, sit on the sand and dip your feet and, you know, maybe there was like the surfers, but the whole lifestyle around like having a sport kind of around the ocean was something that's just not prevalent at all. And I remember like vividly when I would, like I said, when I'd see the junior guards and they'd be running and swimming and I'd be down there with my swim team and just kind of like having an eye on them. Like it always looked so fun to me. And so uh, having a chance to get to Australia and see the culture there. I was like, man, this would be so awesome to like bring a family up in that sort of environment that's around ocean, that's around being healthy and just living a healthy lifestyle. In America, there's really nothing like that. And within the lifeguards, that's, that's where there, there is a little bit of environment where you're there to make rescues, you know, and learn how to prepare to make those rescues on the most stressful days where the rips are pulling the strongest and the beaches are the most crowded. And the racing was kind of like there, but in, depending on, you know, the, the person and the beach, there was a little bit of a stigma if you were, you know, a competitor versus mm. like a real lifeguard. So there's like this little bit of, I don't want to say conflict, but not everybody was a competitor and not everybody wanted to be a, a, a year round professional lifeguard. And um, some people, you know, all the races are on the weekend and the weekends are busiest at, at the beach. So you know, sometimes like, oh, you're this first year lifeguard and you're not putting in your time on the weekends, you're going to these races. And it, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to say anyone treated me bad or anything, but there was yeah, just yeah. like, you know, this kind of uh, uh, a stigma, but I didn't really care. I just was doing what I loved. And, uh, you know, it's interesting in Australia because I was in the surf club, but I was also a professional lifeguard and I was also uh, in the in the mal club. So I'd do the weekend contest in the Mal Club and I'd, I'd be working as a lifeguard and oh, the lifeguards, you always put the swim flags where the best waves are. But I was yeah. also a surfer, but I was also a clubby. So I was in all these three different groups that didn't necessarily always get along, but we yeah. all wanted the same thing to have fun in the ocean, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty similar here in Australia. Like you've got the, 
I guess you get the professional lifeguards, but then you've got volunteered lifesavers and then you've got like the surf clubs and then you've got the surfers and then you've got like everything else that goes in the ocean. And <laughs> there's all these different groups. We all enjoy the ocean. But we all don't really get along that well. Or we, <laughs> yeah. like, you're trying to break down the barriers all the time or you yeah, it's, it's a funny, it's a funny one. It doesn't matter which culture you're in. I think it's a, yep. it's always stigma attached to whatever you do because one thing's always better than the other for some reason. <laughs> but, um, so true. So, so how long did you work at the LA County lifeguards of, before you started doing like obviously you're racing but when did you come over to australia so i became a lifeguard in uh 1994 and then in i want to say nine, uh, 96 or 97 96 it would have been um there was this event called the uh, uh it was called the hawaiian ocean festival and the, it was like this two-day racing event where there were teams from australia new zealand Japan, Hawaii, California. And it was pretty cool. It was like, you know, there was prize money. It was on ESPN and um, they'd have a day of racing at, at Makapu and they'd have a long board race, a long ski race, um, you know, a couple of relays. And then they had a day of racing in Waikiki, you know, swim, outrigger canoe and all these events counted towards points for your team. And, you know, there's a winner at the end. And then there was this event called the King's Race, which was a, a long Ironman race. Um, that happened that was just an individual thing where you'd run from the Duke statue all the way down to San Suchi where the Duke first set his world record. And then you'd ski paddle all the way down back to um, the other side. And then you'd swim to back to the Duke statue and then do a like one mile board lap. Um, and so it was this cool thing and all, you know, top like uh, Australian, you know, guys would come out and I met Dean Gardner who you had on your show and just, I mean, what a legend that guy is. And, got to know him through the this Hawaiian Ocean Fest and he's like ah you know mate you should come out to Manly I think it was one of those things that just comes out of your mouth when you're drunk you know and then one day yeah. I showed up in Manly <laughs> yeah he's like oh hey and, and uh no but Dean you know helped me out in, in Manly and I, I I went there on my way um because I was part of this uh LA County has this uh, uh biannual event with Victoria lifeguards or excuse me California not just LA County California has this biannual event with the Victoria lifeguards. It's called the Wayland Shield. It's been going on since like 1964. So Is the event like Half happened. Moon Bay? It's it 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 goes in different places, but it's been in Half Moon Bay. And the yeah. event, like you travel every every four years. So it happens in LA, and then two years later it's in Victoria. And then the next time it's in LA. So this was happening in 90s in uh in early January of 98. And then I had also made the US World Lifesaving Team that was competing at Murawai Beach in New Zealand. So I had been going to this Hawaiian Ocean Festival. I made this Wayland Shield and the World Team. So I went to Manly um, like six weeks early to get some training in before these two like international competitions. And um, I, went, I went to Manly and trained there with the group and then went on to Victoria and then over to, to New Zealand. And I mean, man, can you imagine like a kid from Walnut who like wanted to be by the beach and then all of a sudden I'm in Manly where like it's this mile long beach where like everything is going on. There's epic waves. There's like people training on all crafts. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, a, a, a ocean lover's heaven. And yeah. uh, so I, 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 I found that place and just kept going back year after year. And um actually worked there as a professional lifeguard and, you know, got my bronze medallion and did the, did the clubby stuff as well and uh, competed in longboard. And, and so I started going and competing for Manly and doing all the carnivals and a couple Aussie titles. So it was, you know, kind of deemed, it was the Hawaiian ocean festival that got me to meet some of the Australian guys to then, um, you know, come over and Hayden Kinney used to be the captain of the team. So in the early years, you know, Marty would be on the team and, you know, guys like Chris Maynard and uh, it, it was awesome. And um, one year uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, it was, I think, 99 where I had been training in Australia for a couple of years and I'll never forget uh, Steve Poland was the current I uh, Australian Ironman champion that year. And yeah. when they had the, the, uh, that they had a sprint Ironman race on one of the days, it was an individual day. And I, I had a run up the beach finish between myself, Corey Hutchins and Steve Pullen. And I got third in that race, but there was a couple other Australians that I beat and, 
you know, it was like, that was like one of my most favorite races that I'll remember. I was like, man, I just had a sprint finish with the current Australian Ironman champion. And yeah. um, I mean, Corey those Hutchins were some good years. <laughs> Corey Hutchins was a legend who was in Manly at that time as well. He was competing for the New Zealand team and, and I uh, had a really good board race that year as well. And, and uh, came really close to winning the board race. Um, another kind of sprint finish where I ended up third, but um, those years kind of, you know, set me up for um, for some good years competing for LA County and world teams. And then who knew that all that, you know, training on different craft and I did some outrigger canoe racing when I was in Australia as well. And, and then, you know, later on stand up paddling comes around and it's like, Oh, I've been training for this my whole life, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is amazing how there isn't more guys like stepping across from surf life saving to stand up because like the skills that you get from life saving and all those different sports in the ocean, it just sets you up so well for, stand up paddling and sort of being able to, to race around the world. There's sort of a bit of a stigma there as well, I think, between the, the Ironman guys and the sub guys. And we saw that earlier in the year with that Iron X thing, but we won't go there. But so who were you racing with, um, with when you're racing at Manly? Like who were the main guys that were around the club? Obviously you said Dean was there and uh, Corey Hutchings. Um, who else was around? Oh, this was like, a, I didn't train with them, but that's when, you know, Jeremy Cotter was in, was in Queenscliff and, a guy by the name of Brad Gall was training and oh, yeah. um, Reen, yeah, Reen Corbett was training down there a lot as well. And um, Craig Riddington was the coach for Manly for some of that time. But um, I also trained with, uh, with Rod, Rod Taylor, uh, Tails, um, who was training, um, I'm blanking on the, uh, the girl's name from Queenscliff, who later went on to win Ironman titles and became a kayaker. Um, but she was training with us yeah, as, Morrison? as well. Um, uh, no, um, I'm, I'm not, man, not I'm Carla Gilbert. Her, I don't, she, she didn't not, do, not, she not Carla. Um, it was like the next kind of after Carla, to f Carla, a few years later, uh, Belinda halfway, halfway, not no? Belinda, a, a little We're bit. We're not going to get here, are we? Yeah, no, but I will yeah. remember because she, uh, uh, there was a guy named Cameron Coglin. Um, yep. who was training there. He was kind of a young up and comer at, at the time. And, um, um, you know, he was awesome. And uh, there was a board paddling crew that uh, trained with as well at, uh, from the freshwater crew. And man, I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now, but there are some really good ski paddlers. That's when Dean was kind of first setting up some of the ski paddling races down there. And, uh, you know, there was just a lot of legends around and in those you know, the manly freshwater weekend of carnivals was always like um, a big, you know, carnival weekend. And, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I almost, I almost made the final one year in the board at the manly carnival. And I'll never forget. I was, I was leading, leading the semi and, you know, a little wave comes and all of a sudden there's 12 guys on the, on the wave. And, you know, I, I, I always considered myself a pretty fast runner, but man, the guys are so good at just that last, you know, every little part. And that's why you're talking about guys that race surf lifesaving coming over to stand up, you know, that I feel like they're good at so many little aspects of the racing. It's like, okay, there's getting through the surf and then there's settling in. And then there's those 20 yards before and after the buoy, that's a whole race within itself. And then there's catching those little bumps and then there's settling in your positioning to when you, get off the board, how you get off the board, how you run up the beach. And I'll never forget going from first to 12th. And the, there was a moment where I'm like, Oh, I'm going to make the final. And then like you look back and, and you're like, no. And that's one of the things I really loved about the surf racing is you could be in the lead and not end up in the lead, or you can be in the back and, 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 and end up catching a wave. And that's, I think a you know, good kind of metaphor for life as well as just like, you know, that whole never give up kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, there were some 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 legendary, you know, uh, Iron Man. Um, obviously, you know, Craig Riddington and, and the surf stuff, and um, and uh, you know, really good lifeguarding there. Like I worked as a professional lifeguard, and you know, for LA County, everything's all the rescues are made with the rescue cans, with the buoys, right? You swim out, you give someone a buoy, you pull them in. And Manly, you get to the beach, you set up the boards where the rips are going to be, and you jump on a board and go rescue people. And you know, that I think along with the training, but that really helped kind of like develop the surf skills, right? To be able to yeah. get through waves, get, get a, you know, a victim, 
bring them back to the beach, surfing them in. It's not like the board rescue race where you're both good on the board. You're bringing in somebody who's maybe never been on the board. And yeah. a lot of times they love it. They're like, yeah, you know, because you're surfing. Yeah. And so I really think I learned a lot about the ocean and different crafts by, you know, making rescues. We made so many rescues at that beach. And it's amazing in Australia, I think because of the, the geography of the land and how the wind comes and the sand moves so quickly and conditions change really fast and it can go from a normal sunny day and you have the flags in the perfect bank and then all of a sudden conditions start changing like so fast way more than in 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 california and so i really enjoyed like that you know dynamic environment and i think it helped build my ocean skills and made up for all the missed time as a kid <laughs> Yeah, it definitely changes the, um, the the perspective on the ocean. Because, and you see it, like you have a lot of tourists who come to Australia. And I was a lifeguard on the Gold Coast, for, well, very part-time, but on the Gold Coast for about five years. And I did all my, I did 10 years of um, volunteer service with the with Surf Life Saving, that as, as it was part of like, you have you had to do it to race and that type of thing. But yeah, the, the conditions just change so fast. Like banks here one minute, the banks over there. And then you have people getting swept out in rips or people don't understand the flag, especially working at surfers or something like that, where there's, there's so many people who don't understand what's going on. Because like you go to Europe and it's just like, oh, everything's a lake. You just go swimming wherever you want and you're fine. And then all of a sudden you're 200 meters out off surface paradise and you don't know what's going on. But I do find it interesting with the, um, the, the lifeguards in the LA County and obviously across Hawaii and that they do do a lot of rescues with the, the tube. Why, why is that? Why don't they use the board? You know, I, it's, I, this is just like, I don't know a hundred percent. This is just my opinion, but it takes a lot of skill to rescue somebody on a board, you know? Yeah. And there's also a lot of liability in Australia. If somebody gets hurt, if like someone's going to die and you go to save them, but then you get to the shore and they slip off the board, the board hits them in their head. It's their fault. In, the, in America, that same scenario, they're going to die. You save their life, but then they slip and hit their head on the board. You're going to get sued, you know? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of, it's, it's sad, but this is like, there's a lot of liability is one reason. And then the second reason is just, like I said, I think it takes a lot of skill to do it. And for LA County and, and a lot of California, it's more of a numbers game. We have so many towers that are spread out. You know, when I was lifeguarding, there were 750 lifeguards. I would say maybe 50 of them were, would be able to affect a rescue on a, on a board. And in my, the first couple of years, I wouldn't have even put myself in that, in that yeah. caliber, right? But it's a lot easier to just swim out with fins, give somebody the can, and just swim, make it all the person has to do is hold on to the can. So I think it's a skill thing, and I think it's a liability thing as well. And what is it with America and suing everybody? Like, how did that come part of your culture? We're going way off track here, but what, <laughs> what, what is it about? Why, why is it like that? Like, cause we have it sort of a little bit here in Australia, but not really like we're not, we're a little bit influenced by America, but not like it is like a bit more common sense. I feel like in Australia, it's like, Oh no, that guy did save your life. We're not going to sue him because he, he risked his life to save you. It, 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 it doesn't make sense. And you know, one example is like the famous, like make, there's a famous McDonald's incident where some lady puts coffee on her car, a hot coffee spills on her and she sues McDonald's and wins. That's the crazy part, right? Is like, you know, she like in Australia, you're just like, Oh, that's dumb. That's your fault. In America, yeah. you sue and you actually win and get money from a corporation. So that's why we have all these silly labels and you know, all these things. And I, I, I think it's like, it should be more, more of a common sense. And, uh, you know, taking it back to skateboarding, where uh, at, at some point, we didn't have skate parks in America for a long time. There was like a couple. But the reason that we didn't have them is because if someone fall, fell and hurt themselves, they would be able to sue, right, if you had just a community skate park. But then, uh, I don't know exactly when, but they made a law that skateboarding is a, I forget the exact classification, but it's a dangerous sport or a, whatever they, they, they termed it as. So because it, inherently it was a dangerous sport that allowed um, different you know, m municipalities to use their funds to build skate parks. But when I was growing up, there was like a couple of skate parks and they all went out of business. And then once they, they deemed skateboarding you know, a, 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 a dangerous um, you know, activity, that allowed the municipalities to build the skate parks. And now 
you know, we see what's happening and they're everywhere. And you just, I don't, I don't know the reason. And it's, that's why it's one of the reasons why I loved Australia so much. I feel like more common sense, you know, like don't yeah. put the hot coffee when, and drive away and let it spill on you. If you yeah. do, it's your fault. Yeah, no, it is a bit more common sense over here, I think, but <laughs> all cultures are different as, as we know. Um, how long did you live in Australia for? It's actually, we competed at four Australian titles. Um, you did ski boards, swim, you become national champion um, over in the US, uh, the board, iron board rescue a couple of times. I uh, did the Goodwill Games. Like, so you did it for quite a long period of time. Like, so you're racing from like when you were like 20 to like when you were 30, I guess? Yeah, so a little before. I, I spent like, like seven, you know, Australian summers, uh, US winters. Um, I did some years on Manly and Manly. And then I actually did one year on the Gold Coast as well, um, where I trained uh, with, with Mick DeBetta and was a part of the Surfers Paradise Club. So I trained with Mick doing board paddling and then, uh, Trevor Handy had a squad as well and used to train um, out of his house with, you know, young Shannon Eckstein and, and those guys. Um, and that was, you know, obviously like, wow, it was, um, you know, really cool. Um, but I, I would go over there. My first year I did the six weeks. The next year I did four months. And then the rest of the time I would do seven to eight months um, in Australia. And I actually got a work visa um, to work as a manly lifeguard. So that was enabling me to stay there for for that long and then I would come back over to the US and go to work you know lifeguarding and I'd roll right from there um, you know summer springtime and then right back into the US um, in great shape <laughs> ready to do all the US stuff yeah, as well. Fit, fit and tan coming into summer how good is that? <laughs> yep it was awesome. You'd be, you'd be, doing, the, you'd be doing the true Baywatch you'd be, be alongside uh, Zach Efron running down the beach I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah I, Actually, did a few seasons on Baywatch because, um, you know, the founder of Baywatch is is a guy named Greg Bonan, who is a real LA County lifeguard. And you know, a lot of that stuff is you know Hollywoodish, but a lot of it he uses real lifeguard stuff. And the name Baywatch is actually taken from currently, even still now, there are seven boats that that are spread throughout the county, and those boats are are called the Baywatch boats, not because of the show. That's what they're always co called. The show was taken from those boats. And so Greg Bonan would actually, you know, help sponsor, um, you know, some equipment for the racers and things like that. And once I started doing racing and there was one year he brought all the Uncle Toby's over and had a race and had a whole Baywatch show with a lot of the um, Uncle Toby's guys. And so I got into that show and then worked for a couple of seasons as like a, you know, as an extra in the show and kind of like extra water safety sort of thing. So, um, you know, he did a lot financially to help sponsor some of the teams and stuff and and uh yeah so thanks greg <laughs> yeah no that's awesome it's always good to hear those insights so did you were you ever like trying to like do the tobies when you were over in australia or were you down there watching it or was it was that something like you were trying to aspire to uh, do when you were down in australia yeah i i did the tryout a few times but you know i was i don't think i ever got like and had the you know time to really train the running and and some of the other stuff because i was having to work you know as a lifeguard and try to fit in the training so i don't think i ever got to the point where i was skilled enough just in the speed i needed the help of the help slash luck of waves and the years that i was trying out the the tryouts were always in malulaba um, where there wasn't any waves and so i never had and it was all on fitness and yeah. so i i i, I you know, I felt like I was pretty good in the surf. Um, the, the, the first carnival, the first board race I ever won was actually in, um, was in Australia before I ever won a board race in America. And it was the, the Curly Carnival. And it was so, it was bombing that day where they had to actually cancel all of the events. They didn't do any under 18 events and they canceled a lot of the women events. And um, I'll never forget like the board race, I, I I made it out with a, a guy named, I believe his name is Sean Kenny. And we made it out and we, we rounded the last can to kind of start turning in. I, and I was, I was scared, man. It was like, you know, the biggest surf I'd ever raced in. And I remember like we were paddling in and I saw this huge set was coming and I wasn't sure he turned to paddle back out. So I'm like, okay, I'm turning to paddle back out. <laughs> so we paddle back out and then like this first wave comes and he goes and I let it go. And, you know, you know, on a board, you can, mo you can make most waves, right? 
but he didn't, yeah. he didn't make the wave. He held his board, but he didn't make it. And I could see that. So I took off on the second one and I bounced and I bounced and he still hadn't gotten to his, his board was upright. And I remember passing him and, you know, I, I, I won that, that race and we finished, there were still guys paddling out, but me super memorable day. So memorable day. And so I'd always like to think of myself as pretty decent in the surf and felt that if there, if there were waves, I w that that would have helped me possibly make it in um, to yeah. the uncle Toby's. It was always a dream. Um, I do the tryouts. I would, I went down um, to watch as many races as I can. Cause I was like trying to be one of the athletes, but I was also a fan as well. So I saw the Portsea race. Um, you know, I'd watch them all on TV. That was the other cool thing about living in Australia is just to be able to, you know, you can watch them all on TV. I remember, you know, when Kai Hurst first made it onto the tour when he was, you know, 15 and won that first race and bombing Piha and just so many cool memories as a like American fan of, of the sport. And uh, yeah, I did try out a few times, but never made it. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine being a part of that scene and how exciting it would have been when all those guys were sort of basically superstars and household names over here in Australia. And I guess a little bit over in America, they were sort of stepping in there when trying to do those Baywatch scenes and stuff with, uh, with Trev and a couple of the other guys. So it must have been a really cool era to be a part of. Um, I was, I think I was 10 when it finished all, all finished up, but I still remember I was telling Kai the other day when I was interviewing him, uh, one of the last races at Manly Beach, I got to hold his paddle and get a photo with him. I was like, oh, it's the best day ever. I still remember as a kid. <laughs> yes. but yeah, it's, it's, quite, yep. it's quite funny how things change. But um, so you do the Ironman stint. And when did you, oh, sorry, the, the surf life saving stint over here in Australia, summer's on and off. How long did you do that for? Uh, for like seven, eight years. And then, you know, I finally realized, all right, I'm never going to like make a living, you know, doing Ironman racing and, um, you know, it was, it was a, it was a great, great run. And then just, um, you know, wanted to, you know, think about my future and all that. So that's when, um, you know, I started getting into the teaching and, you know, did the, you know, teaching PE for a few years and, um, you know, to have some sort of security and, uh, you know, job security and all that. And, you know, but the ocean kind of always drew me and, um, you know, had some, uh, opportunities with, uh, you know, when board companies started coming out and, and one of the owners of, of this company called Boardworks uh, was a, a lifeguard named Mike Fox. And he had seen me compete in the lifeguard, you know, competitions and figured, you know, I would be able to do stand up. And so, you know, helped me with the board and a paddle. And then just like I did when I first became an LA County lifeguard and, you know, training and as much as possible and started doing that and you know the races were starting to come around and you know there was a lot of people getting into the sport in the early years and and uh companies and you know money was being thrown around a lot more than i think than than now sp specifically you know for the athletes and i was just kind of you know got in got into it that way and um and yeah so it was just like a like a luck luck of the moment type of thing with you know, Mike Fox honing the company and they had these new boards and, and, uh, interesting, just, I never even thought about it now, but the boards were, were, uh, uh they were called M and M made by this company called Morelli and Melvin and Morelli mm -hmm. and Melvin, they make yacht boats and, you know, thinking about what, you know, what Kai Hurst does now with his, you know, with his racing there. And it's kind of a strange little, uh, thing that I never thought about, but that was the first board I ever paddled was this board made by a yacht company it's actually kind of a fast board because they you know used a whole different technology they weren't coming from the surf shape kind of thing they were coming from designing you know the fastest yachts in in the world and so it uh, it was a good board for a few years and was this sorry was this prone paddling that you were doing or was this, uh, this, this was the stand-up yeah so also oh, so um, these were the first stand-ups and what year was this this is like 2010 so um, okay, so I, jump forward a little bit, like probably like yeah, fifteen years later, almost from from when you first went over to Australia. Yep. So I did Australia like ninety eight through you know two thousand and four sort of thing, yeah. and then two thousand four till nine was doing the teaching thing, and then um you know, and then just kind of veered into the the ocean stuff. I'd gone back to to lifeguarding, and and um you know I, I wanted to go back to school and and uh you know get a get a 
you know, higher degree and things like that. And then just veered, ve veered back to the ocean and, and uh, never did, never went back to do the school thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny how the ocean always calls you back. I sort of, I think I don't really need it. I can do anything. And then I'm like, oh, I should go to the beach. I should go in the water and do something. So it's just one of those things. It's intrinsic. Once you start doing it, you just have to do it. You have to keep doing yeah. it. calling you back, as you say. But yeah, I never heard of Eminem before. So that's, that's something I've learned today for sure. Um, and then, so 2010, you start competing in the stand-up. Yeah. And then 2011, yeah. you win your first Carolina Cup. What was the scene like back then? Because you sort of had like the, the Jamie Mitchells, the Annabelle Anderson, I think was around for those early days. Um, I remember hearing a couple of names like, Can like Candace Appley was telling me about around that time as well. So like, what was the scene like when it first started? Because it was quite a, it sort of like exploded in a way through that period up towards like 2015. Yeah, no, there was just, you know, so many races kind of just, you know, starting out and, I think it was a geographical thing as well. Where like, okay, here's, you know, there were races in California, a few races in Hawaii, Florida, and so now there is this new way, new race in, you know, kind of the the northern east northeast uh, side of the uh, of the United States, and you know, brands wanted, you know, their 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 presence over there as well. So, um, you know, Boardworks had uh, some boards in a shop, and they're like, hey, you know, let's let's go do this race and. Um, it was in those early years, you know, uh, there's a lot of barks around and Joe Bark was there and had, you know, his whole crew and, um, you know, uh, the quick blade founder, Jim Terrell was, was there. And that was one of Larry Kane's, uh, from Canada, one of his first, um, events as well. And, um, Chase Kosterlitz, if you remember him, Chase was, uh, was, was there that year as well. And then a number of, you know, of other guys, uh, there's a, a uh, female named Karen Rand, who was one of the, who won that year for the women. She was kind of one of the early, um, you know, leaders in, in, in that. And, uh, you know, like you said, Candace was there as well, but I mean, the scene was awesome. You've been to Wrightsville beach. That place is just beautiful, you know? So I was just like loving being able to go to new places and, you know, they're, they're so hospitable. We went there and Haywood Newkirk, you know, we went surfing and, I remember like Colin McPhillips, you know, who is a world longboard champion and Matt Becker, we all went surfing, you know, that was like the waves weren't epic, but it was like, you know, waist high and offshore and I'm surfing on the East coast. So it was pretty cool. And, you know, just the lead up to the event, are we going to start off going this way or start off going this way? And yeah. everyone's got their predictions at what, Oh no, no. My, my thing says we're going this way. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> my forecast says we're going the other way. Yeah. And back then we actually started on the inlet. So we started on the inlet and went around and then came back and finished in the inlet. So that whole downwind run was just, it wasn't kind of not cut in half, but it was just the whole straight uh, downwind run. And it was just like, it was a really good, uh, good vibe at that event. And, you know, people brought their like homemade moonshine at the after party. And it was just like, it was, it was crazy, man. It was, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun and, and, and just, um, a, a, a cool thing to be a part of. And, um, you know, look, looking back as it was like still like one of the hardest races, um, I've ever like put my body through. Cause you know, luckily like Chase was on one side and me and Larry Kane and, and Jim were on the other side. And I remember kind of leading the train and, and, uh, Larry Kane, who I'd never met before, you know, a couple miles into it, he's like, Hey, Anthony, like, I'm just sitting back here, you know, not doing anything like, you know, we can work together if you want. And, uh, you know, I'm not that good in the open ocean. So you'll probably, you know, pull ahead of me in the open ocean, but you know, let's work together. So, you know, I, th I, I was like, wow, that's cool. You know, and I, I love telling that story because, you know, there's certain etiquette and drafting and yeah. not everyone, you know, talks about it, but it was just cool that he just, you know, here's this guy that's experienced at racing and, you know, we communicated and Jimmy's like, Hey, I'm slow. I'm just going to hang in third. And we're like, okay, you make our paddle. So we'll just pull you the whole <laughs> yeah. way. So, so Larry and I, you know, shared the lead for, you know, I think we were doing three or five minutes at a time. And then, you know, just like he said, we got to the open ocean and, you know, we had built a lead on chase cause he was working on the other side of the channel on his own. And, you know, he, he, he caught me, uh, coming, you know, on the downwind part. And, you know, I had a little bit of a lead. He'd catch me, I'd pull away, he'd catch me, I'd pull away. And that whole rest of the way, we just like raced in. And I literally like 
finished the race and just I was and it was a pretty good payout right so I was like thinking about making rent you know yeah and I just like I like finished the race and I've never had the feeling of like every single muscle in my body cramp and I fell off the board and like someone had to pull me to the side and like pour Gatorade down my throat and um you know as it as the event keeps you know the people like yourself and you know Danny and T2 like all these legends are winning it and it just like makes me so proud that I pushed my body that hard not knowing what was to come years later and it's like something that you know I have that trophy I don't have you know we have our special trophies that make it onto the mantle you know and yeah. uh or the, I forget the name of the Australian movie but there's one where there's a famous line this is going straight to the pool room yeah. and uh so th- so uh this this Carolina Cup trophy is on my mantle for sure. Yeah, well, no, it's, a, it's an event that I definitely wanted to win when I came into the sport. And um, just like, obviously, yourself, like sort of like obviously knowing your name and then knowing like obviously that Danny had won it and Travis had won it and Teets won it and won it. And I was like, well, that's the one I need to get on because like, especially as like a, a distance racer in a way, it just had such prestige in the sport and it just sort of held. And then this year was, I think it was going to be the 10th year. It would have been a, I think would have been such a spectacle. Who knows if they're going to actually be able to run in November or or not. I, don't, I won't be able to make it, unfortunately, because I'm still not allowed to leave my country. But um, we'll just have to wait and see. But, yeah, it's, it's such an awesome event and so cool that there are events that have been around for that long now. Yeah, and I and I want to, uh, you know, commend you. Well, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, to be honest, with everything that's going on. And every event that tries to aim, they're going to have, like, Chad or Jack, on they're on and then they're not on so i think it's wishful thinking um and you know it, it would be great if they if they did but just my gut feeling um is is it's probably not going to happen but you know and hats off because i know that um you know coming from perth of course you, you know you're good in in conditions right and you know i know that there was like a certain like you know oh michael's good in flat water and um i know you're really stoked to actually win that because you know, that's really an all, all around event. If you can win that race, you're good in all conditions. You have to grind on the inside. You have to have the leg strength and the downwind, you know, you have start in the surf now. So you're really putting in lots of different fact components of a race and to win, you look at the names of the guys that have won it, you know, in the later years, all, all of you guys are, are great at downwinding. And I know for you, that was like a special thing to like, I know a few people knew, you know, but I think it proved to the world as well that like, okay, everyone knows now, you know, Michael Booth's good in downwind also. So congrats, man. And I know that was a, a hard earned and, and a well fought victory. So I was stoked for you. Yeah. Cause um, yeah, that first one I think was back in 2018 or 2017, I think I won the first one and it was just like, yeah, I, cause you were good at one, cause you were good at like seeing as like you could paddle in Europe and because you were good at something, it was like, but I haven't had the opportunity to race anything else. I was, right. like, I was like, why am I, why am I only good at one thing? So yeah, then it was like, okay, well now I have to prove you're all wrong. So it gives you motivation. So it's not so bad because sometimes you don't yeah. know where your next motivation is going to come from. And um, yep. yeah, that was definitely, that was definitely what I was driving up, especially in that, I mean, that first one as well. It was like myself, um, Travis, Tituan, Connor, like, all these like really good downwind paddlers. And I like, I, I out paddled them in that downwind section. It was like, okay, cool. That part was impressive. I was watching and, you know, and you're like, okay, here's all these, you know, downwind guys, you know, that are downwind specialists sort of thing. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's where like, you know, all the training that you've done. And I think it's incredible, you know, how you're, you know, self coached in um, a lot of, a, a lot of your, all of your training and all the different sports. And so I think that you really put a lot of things together to be able to have what you had at the end of that race and to pull away from down quote unquote downwind guys in the downwind portion of the race. Um, you know, I was, I was, I don't watch a whole lot of events, you know, live to be honest. Yeah. Um, and that's one, that's one that I, that I was watching and it was a, as a fan, like it was a really cool race to watch and, and to know like a little bit, you know, of the backstory behind, like you said, having a chance to prove yourself. Yeah. And, uh, it's like, I remember when, when Kai first came and did the, uh, did the gorge race and I was talking to people I'm like he's a windsurfer of course he's going to be good at downwinding you know like even though he's never done it we've just never or we've never seen him in it but like of course he's going to be good at downwinding he's in wind all the time and obviously he was good in downwinding so yeah he's good uh, that was as well 
yeah yeah that was a fun race to watch yeah yeah no it was good for me too because like like when you're looking up to all those guys and you, and you sort of get that opportunity to race them and to compete against them when you know that they've been training and they're competing and they're fit because i know like especially like danny and and trav were like obviously fit for that um they always do outrig of molokai like that next weekend or the two weeks after that so you know that they're ready rearing ready to go and that's when i always like draw my most or my best performances or when i'm under that pressure or like where it's a bit more exciting or there's a bit more on the line that's when i usually yeah. tend to race better because you, you want to be able to be that best guy when it counts you know like sometimes the local races i i do struggle to get motivated for and they're probably the ones that i lose more <laughs> yeah. of because i'm just like oh well, i'm just down here having fun you know like what, what am yeah. i killing myself for so it's been an interesting especially been an interesting year this year not being able to race and sort of trying to find your motivations from different things but um so how's how's this year been for you like have things changed much or is it all kind of the same or uh, i know you guys got locked down for a little bit yeah it's been i mean you know again hats off to you for kind of just not you know sitting still and just like oh there's no races and you know what you've done with with everything that you're doing now is awesome and you know we we all everyone's had to kind of work a little harder um at and and work outside of their their box sort of thing and so um you know at home i run this i run a you know a, a training club where um you know it's it's an in-person club yeah. Uh, if we can't train in person, like what, what am I going to do? Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, how am I going to keep my clients? And, um, so I, you know, I told them I was going to be doing webinars, you know, twice a week. And, and I, I have all this, you know, I'm always like filming when I'm out there and kind of had an idea of, you know, what I wanted to do. Um, but then when I actually started these things together, I was like, oh my gosh, this is forever to try to get across the things that I wanted to get across in the way that I wanted to do it, you know, as yeah. I'm sure you're finding out and just all the hours you're putting into the little details. And, yeah. uh, you know, so I was trying to do two a week and man, these things are taking me so long, but, uh, you know, I was getting a lot of positive feedback from clients that are successful in their lines of work to where they're yeah. doing PowerPoint presentations and doing presentations to large companies and corporations and, you know, yeah. I'm just a stand-up guy, right? And and athlete. So when yeah. real businessmen, as I'm sure you're getting the same um, input and some of the associations that you know you're having with the you know race partners and the Sean partner and and just um, it was cool to get the feedback. It was cool to work hard in a different avenue. Yeah. Um. It's it was hard for me just like being at home and not being around you know people and. You know, my family, uh, um, you know, my wife um, is a breast cancer survivor. So we were very, very safe with everything that we were doing and interactions. And I think in America, as you probably know, there's like two different ways of where people are. And yeah, it's um, like, it's you like you're either like, if there's a line, you're either like at this end of the line or at this end of the line. There's no like common ground. <laughs> so I'm on the, I'm on the side that tries to, you know, stay as safe as possible and, we, you know, no one really knows what's going on. Everything's new. And so I'd rather err on the side of safety. So we've been, yeah. you know, secluding ourselves and, you know, trying to find, you know, little things that we can do, you know, within our house and just, um, so it's been, you know, fun trying to reinvent yourself. And I was, you know, able to, you know, to keep most of my clients. It's hard, uh, you know, work on lots of different events, you know, with APP, with ISA and, Obviously, none of those events are happening, um, yeah. or APP still may have the events at the end of the year, um, but I think it's hard when people can't travel, and I think yeah. that's, you know, like the Carolina Cup. Well, wait, how can you have it when a defending champion isn't able to leave his country? It's just, just, to me, it, yeah. I feel like everyone should just, everyone's trying so hard to, like, do, to have a, an event, but, like, you want it to happen the right way, in my opinion, yeah. um, and so if I was in charge of events um I, I wouldn't necessarily have it for for those reasons that that i mentioned if everyone can't go and you know or maybe you do call it something different and do something small and local um yeah. but it's 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 been hard you know not not going to uh to those events um obviously financially you know for for my family um and just me getting a chance to be out there it's like so I'm sure the same for you. I haven't been on a plane and it's like so weird, but now I'm like, man, I don't ever want to go on a plane again. Cause it's kind of, 
you know, fun in a way, just being at home with family. And, uh, um, but, you know, I've been, you know, ha getting more, I also do like surf coaching as well. And so I've picked up some additional surf coaching clients um, with longboard and some sup surf. So I've been able to fill the gaps, um, but it's definitely just, you know, a lot of things are different and, you know, just trying to keep myself and, um, and my, and my, and my family safe. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm totally on the same page as that. Just trying to stay safe. It was sort of like a lot of hard conversations at the start when it was like, Oh, what do I do? Like, how do I, like, do I travel? Like, I'm supposed to be racing, but I can't race. And then it's like, how do you reinvent <laughs> yourself? And how do you try and maintain your income? How do you keep your sponsors happy? How do you like, I, yeah, it was just a, such a hard one. And then you have like, mentally you're like oh, all over the place like sometimes you're like you're like yeah i'm good like i'm goal driven i'm like well, i've got like these few things to do then you're like well it's not what i normally do like i'd rather be over here doing this like oh it's just a bit of a, a bit of a roller coaster at the moment that's for sure but uh you said you haven't been on a plane i did get on a plane the other day um last week actually went up to broom which is like in our states it's like wa is such a big state as you probably know it's like i don't know three and a half thousand kilometers like top to bottom so it's a oh quite a big state so but we've got no COVID here currently so they're still doing like a lot of um like st uh, inner state flights or intrastate flights i guess you would call them and that it's okay to sort of jump on a plane here but most of the country's locked down you can't go i can't go east i can't go seas like you can but it's so hard to get exemptions and if you go like people just like haven't been able to come back to australia like imagine that being australian and like wow. not being able to come <laughs> home unless you buy a business class ticket or something like there's like all sorts of things going on over here it's crazy but um, yeah, it just is what it is. Hey? Yeah. Just a, a, such a, a weird, a weird time. Who thought this last year when we're in Paris and all of a sudden now we're not doing anything. I, I, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, you think about all that, uh, it, it impacts so many different things, but like as athletes, like those are, you know, some of the first things that I think about, you know, and not just like the fact that there is no Olympics, but like, let's say swimming, for example, do you have a new Olympic trials? Do you take the same, you know, people that made it that there's so many of those little things, you know, and like college sports, it's like, man, you know, I, I, I don't know if you're a basketball fan at all, but you know, Kobe Bryant passed away. And one of the, one of the, uh, uh, you know, his daughter was big basketball player and, you know, liked college basketball and Kobe did a lot for the WNBA. One of the, the females that spoke at his funeral played college in Oregon and was like the best college player as a, as a junior and could have been drafted first into the WNBA, but chose to stay for her senior year to try and win a national championship. She's having a great year. She's breaking all these records and then COVID happens. She doesn't even get to play in the national championship game because it doesn't happen, you know? And it's like, yeah. there's a million of those like little stories and just, you know, I feel for as an athlete, like, I, you know, what, the training people have gone through and like my heart just goes out to all of those athletes and people putting on the events and, you know, surfing, for example, where you're going to be in, you know, the Olympics for the first time. So what, do, what does U S surfing do? Do they keep, you know, John, John and, you know, Connor Co or who, who's in, uh, Coffin, is it? no, it's, uh, uh, the Kolohe San Indiana? Clemente kid. Kolohe. Kolohe? Yeah. yeah. You keep John, Dan John and Kolohe or do you, do it off of a new thing. It's a whole year later, you know, people are surfing different in a year. And so there's so yeah. many little things like that, that um, people in high places have those tough decisions to make. Um, and, you know, I'm glad I'm not one of them. And um, just as an athlete to stay motivated and to keep training is, you know, difficult. And, you know, we're having all the games starting to come back in, in, in the U S but like, you know, basketball is being played and they're in this little bubble and fake fans and, uh, it's just, it's, it's so, it's so crazy. Um, yeah. but you know, it's reality. And so it's, we just have to, you know, keep pushing forward and hopefully soon we'll be, you know, able to go and visit our friends in other parts of the world again. Yeah. It's such a strange reality though, isn't it? Like you just would have never predicted anything like this to never. ever happen. <laughs> Not in my lifetime anyway. No. I've probably had the easiest lifetime, um, of any generation ever because we never really had any major global conflicts or anything like this. And then all of a sudden we get a pandemic. I was like, it's probably true that we get something like this, but I do, I do feel for like, as, as you say, like a few of those athletes, like I, I, I guess it's hard for me personally, cause I was sort of like racing quite well. And it's sort of like, you only get so many years that you can race well and, and sort of race the top of your game. But I also feel sorry for like the younger guys who are coming through and that type of thing, especially stand up who probably don't get 
those opportunities that maybe I did a few years ago and maybe they can't progress or like they do they choose to do other things now and like as an Olympic athlete like do you retire like a lot of them aren't going to go for another four years it's just so many things happening and, and everyone's got their own like sort of thing I know a lot of pilots who've like lost their jobs and a lot of people yep. in the airline industry and it's just and but yeah it's, well, it's just crazy times but going back to you being an athlete um so 2011 you in the Carolina Cup but like did you have any other like did you, did you race competitively for like a few years or was it like a one year thing and then you started doing different things like announcing and getting involved in events and, and coaching or was it, do you sort of rate to try and race that more elite level or was it sort of a bit past you and you want to do other things? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I probably did like three or four good years and then, you know, saw the writing on the wall and just, you know, more, uh, you know, good athletes were, were coming in. And I think, you know, at first it was, you know, a bunch of, you know, surf people and a lot of the races were, were, were races in and out of the waves. And, you know, you maybe, you know, didn't have to, you know, train as hard as you, you do now to win races. Um, and then, you know, I had, I always train. And so I had, you know, the surf part of it, but then also the, 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 the discipline and training. And then as more guys were coming in and training and were great athletes and, you know, you started getting a trickle of, of, you know, people that were, coming from out from other sports and um so you know 2011 2012 at you know at carolina cup i think i got third the next year and and um you know some of the bigger races there is like a local event you know that was like elite kind of a lead up to the battle of the paddle that uh um you know i won a couple of times in years where there was guys like jamie and connor and you know so i had a couple of good years at, at those races um i did well in races that were in the surf um, battle of the paddle I man I was, oh, it kills me I, even to think about it it was like I, somehow I missed a wave I, I'd had a really good run on lap one and uh you know it was there was 12 of us on a wave I was only the only one to make it around all of a sudden you know I'm in that kind of second pack there was a pack of three and another pack of four including me so we we're all kind of racing for fourth and then on lap two somehow I was like in this in the spot like ready to catch an easy Doheny wave and somehow miss the wave. And so then that, you know, all of a sudden I'm seventh and I'm with the next group. So um, I would have been stoked to have, you know, been a top 10 in the battle of paddle one year, but um, I think I ended up 13th that year, which was, you know, my best BOP finish, which isn't too shabby, but like top 10 is a whole better winnings, you know, one thing, but um, yeah, you know, yeah, I felt course. like I was in that kind of top five range, but never just, you know, one wave, you know, made the difference uh, that year. Um, and, uh, you know, I did some, you know, some of the other races, but, you know, I was older and, you know, I, I, I kind of like, uh, in the early days I was competing in, in sup surfing as well, you know, on some of the APP events and then just through circumstance, you know, started commentating a little bit, you know, with APP here and there. And then, um, you know, I, uh, started putting on, uh, my, my own event, um, and, uh and just like got into that so then once battle of paddle stopped after 2014 so 2015 was the first uh pacific paddle games and i just you know landed that job as the race director there and that basically ended my <laughs> my racing career i would have loved to have done you know one of the pacific paddle games but at least i was getting a guaranteed check versus a check that i probably wouldn't have gotten <laughs> yeah, as an yeah, athlete. Yeah. so <laughs> i think you know it was like you know, it's just reality, right? All athletes have to kind of like move on. And it wasn't like, you know, there was like, oh, I'm going to retire. It was just like, how do I, you know, continue in this, you know, I can go get a real job or I can, you know, figure out how to make it work. And, and uh, as you know, at, at that's at the same time, like I said, in the beginning, man, there was money getting thrown around that like, I look back, I'm like, I was, wow, really, that was happening. And, yeah. you know, it was like travel budget and, and all this stuff. And, I see athletes now that are like, I believe at a much, you know, higher level than maybe I was then that are struggling to make ends, ends meet because, yeah. um, you know, I think in the early days, the board companies came in with a lot of money, but then everyone was like prying on the board companies. They had to sponsor the athletes. They had to make the equipment they yeah. had, you know, the, the margins were low. They had to sponsor the events. They had to give boards, you know, for prizes. So it was like, everyone was just sucking away from the board companies. And, 
And, uh, you know, that's, I think we're, we're seeing the, the, what's happening now from those years, all those years of that, you know, and, and so I started, you know, doing the race directing thing. And it's interesting. I was thinking about, I was talking with my mom when I grew up swimming, my mom was always uh, the meet secretary and would work at the swimming meet. So I was always a part of helping to run the swimming meets, being the runner and just, you know, figuring out how it all worked. You took the timing cards, you took them here, they got printed out, then you posted them up. And then when I became an LA County lifeguard and I taught um, junior guards for a lot of years and helped run um, the junior guard events and uh, like for, for the uh, uh, lifeguard regionals for, you know, the Western uh, part of the United States. So junior guards in, in US, they're broken into four different age groups. There's the youngest, the C's, the B's, the A's, and double A's all broken into ages. So there would be four separate venues happening. Each of these four separate venues were running seven different events. And so I, and when LA County, you know, each uh, agency would run the regionals for two years. So when LA County ran the regionals, um, you know, I was kind of the guy that was out racing the most. So I, I put together this like a uh, doc, this like 15 page document on how to like, run you know the regionals in a professional way having been to aussie titles and all these things and so i think i really helped put it all together in a package because you know i've been to the races and regionals and you're like waiting around and it's never going to start and it's late and you know you're waiting because yeah. it took that it took that heat a long time because of surf so there's a lot of things i learned from racing in australia and other places and then brought that back so i'd always kind of done the race directing and then once stand up came around, you know, I had, it was born in me from when I was swimming and then as a lifeguard help organizing events. And then as a competitor, you're always kind of like, you know, man, this race should do this or that race should do that. Or, oh, wouldn't it be great if this? And so I, you know, I'd always try and put those things together. Like my dream is like, you know, you know and I hope, you know, I think you maybe see it as I always try to have, the first thing is like fair, right? I always want something that I can help it be the most fair for the athletes. That's like yeah. the number one thing that I try to do and then try to make it, you know, the other things where it's on time and all the other parts. But I just kind of like got swept into, into that role. And, and I'll tell you that like, I love the announcing way more because it's so much more fun. There's zero pressure. And yeah. I love telling the story of the athletes, right? I feel like a lot of the announcers maybe don't know some of the backstories. They don't take the time to, go and investigate to be able to tell the stories and talk about their family and the people that are watching and supporting. And I really love that aspect of the sport and being able to do that. Yeah. But I also feel like I'm a good person for the job to do the race directing. And even though it's the hardest thing and man, there's some stressful, stressful, stressful times. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud and honored to do it and try to like represent an event for, for you guys that I would be stoked to compete in as an athlete and that's, and that's always my goal. So, you know, I did the racing for a few years. I saw the writing on the wall and just knew that it was, I was moving in a different direction and it was kind of a natural, you know, progression um, into it and just, you know, by circumstance. And then just once I did one event, you know, well, and then, okay, then ISA was looking for someone new and then I stepped into APP and just kind of like evolved into that and, 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 yeah, so here I am. <laughs> yeah, well, then that's great because you're pivoting into something that you're still passionate about. Like you can't be racing, but you still want to be involved in some way. And I'm sure I'll try and do something similar as, as the sort of time progresses. And my, 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 maybe I can't be at the front of the pack anymore, but uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure I'll know. The, the young kids will tell me once I'm, once I'm not good enough. <laughs> on but um, yeah, so it's, it's cool to obviously see you. And I really enjoy working with you at the events. Like even though like I'm not technically working with you, but like as an athlete, it's always like fair and reasonable and like, when we have discussions it's not like it's never heated or anything like that it's just like well this is my point these are your points then we just move through it like it's never i never really feel like yeah some race directors i i really struggle with because they don't listen they don't want to have someone else's opinion like hey, this is my way this is the right way and you're you all else should bugger off but it's it's always nice to have someone who's been there who's done that and understands sort, sort of from like the athlete's perspective but then also from the events perspective then you can come to that nice common ground no, it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily looking to do it my way. I'm looking to do it the best way. And yeah. I'm hope there are guys like yourself that, you know, you, you, you've never been one to come up 
in a derogatory way or in a uh, you know heated way you're always you're always very respectable and that's something that i really appreciate and have always like you know when i talk to other people like man it's really awesome the way that boothy comes up and gives suggestions or asks questions you've never mm. been like you should do this or you should do that and there are many athletes and parents of athletes that do come up and do that and so it's you know you've always been one and i feel that you're not necessarily necessarily looking for something that's going to be an edge for you you're looking for the same fairness that i'm looking for mm. and that's why i think we've always seen eye to eye and even if something you know it is something that isn't going to be something that i implement that you suggest you're never like oh you should have done that and so I, I just i thank you for having the respect that not every athlete does and you know it's interesting how working in you know this pan americans and isa events where now there's olympic committee type of um uh, uh 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 guys that are there watching the event and we've we've been put on a new platform of professionalism and i think it's it's important for all of the stand-up paddling athletes to realize that you have to treat everyone as a professional and you know you would never go in another sport and go argue or yell at a person that's in charge and yet and still we have that happen in our sport the athletes and parents of athletes and supporters want the professionalism from our end, but they don't necessarily do the same thing and demand it from themselves and from their, uh, from their kids. And that's an area that I really try to talk to the athletes and say, hey, do you realize that if you're in another sport, you would be fine for those words that you just said to me? Yeah. And we, if I try to be as professional as I can, and I think you've always been a professional athlete, not just on your Instagram handle or anything, but professional in the way that you conduct yourself. Um, and that's awesome. Well, I think it's just all about treating others the way that you would like to be treated. If you came up to me and you said like, you did this wrong, I wouldn't want you to yell at me about it. I just want you to explain <laughs> to me why I did it wrong. And I'm like, oh, okay, fair enough. I did it because yeah. of this reason, but if it's wrong, it's wrong. Like, you know, I never really try. I maybe, maybe when I was younger, I probably learned how to, how to deal with things and deal with situations, but I've always been uh, good at sort of finding common ground and just being, I don't know, fair and reasonable. That's all you want to be. That's it. It's treat others as you want to be treated. I mean, in every single religion, that's pretty much common theme, you know? <laughs> that's it. And so you, you're obviously very heavily involved with the ISA, with APP. You're like doing ISA webcasts. You're the director of the ISA games. You're doing the APP uh, directing now. But what's the state of the sport now, um, in your opinion, like with the, the ISA and the, the ISCF? sort of coming down with that decision like what does the future look like in the next five to ten years like from what i from what i understand um the the verdict came down with cas saying that the isa should be the olympic um direction for the sport however they don't necessarily get the say and it can still be decided by um the icf and this is even if the sport gets to the olympics um but both both organizations can run events but then there's also like all these other organizations who basically run events independently, like mum and dads or people who just love the sport. And then there's, there's all these different things that are sort of moving in motion in, in stand up paddling. And one person's like, I own the sport, you own the sport. Like who owns the sport? Like, well, it's like, it's owned by the paddlers at the end of the day, but like, what do you see as the state of the sport at the moment? And, and how do you see it moving forward from sort of like it's highs maybe in 2015 or 2016 or, or a little bit different stuff that's been going on the last few years. Like what's next? Yeah, it's it's a it's a, a loaded question that I you know I really enjoy talking about, and uh, you know there's so many different components to it. And one of the first question things when people ask, "What do you think about you know SUP in the Olympics?" and I I pose the question back to them. I say, "Well, what do you mean SUP in the Olympics?" And I say, "I say, okay, the IOC comes to you and says, you know, Michael Booth." Here, you run the SUP Olympics. Tell me exactly what you're gonna do, who's gonna be in it, what events you're gonna have. And, and I ask people that, they're like, uh, uh, nobody knows, you know? And so when we talk about being SUP in the Olympics, I don't think anyone really has a grasp of what that means. What is SUP in the Olympics? Well, everyone has their own little thing. It's, it's a you know? 20 kilometer distance race from what I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, and if 
if people ask the question back to me, it's something that I've thought about it, you know, quite a bit. And, you know, to use swimming as an example, right? Under the swimming umbrella, you've got synchronized swimming, you know, you've got uh, open water swimming, you've got races from, you know, 50 meters now, I think is in all the way up to, you know, 1500 meters, you have all these different strokes in swimming. And I feel like that same sort of thing would be good for our sport because there's so many different disciplines in our sport. I think there should be a 20 mile distance race. I also really like river paddling and I think it's exciting. And I think that the down river is some sort of down river format would be something cool to watch. Um, I love the surf aspect of our sport. And I think that would be something cool to watch. There's all obviously venue, you know, restrictions in, in, in that sort of environment. But I feel like the surf side of our sport is something that's exciting. And if you look at the sports that the Olympics have been, the newer sports that they've been bringing into the Olympics, they're more youthful kind of uh, uh, action sports because they're exciting. The mountain climbing, the BMX, the skateboarding. So these sports that are the newer sports are not the like traditional racing sports. And, you know, I don't think there's, um, you know, I work with ISA, but I also have an open mind. And I think that, yeah, the 200, the 500, the 1,000, those events can be exciting to watch. But I think that there are, uh, there's, you know, seven different disciplines of 200 and 500. And adding one more, is it really going to be great for our sport? Or is it just going to be one more part of an existing event already? And so I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. I'm saying those races are great. And there's, uh, you know, there, there is a place for them. And so with the decision that came down, you know, kind of a convoluted decision, I didn't read the whole thing. I've, I read both of the, eight, uh, of the organization's press releases and, you know, I didn't think that ICF was going to be stopped from running events and they get to continue running events. Great. I think ISA has been doing a lot to push um, for, for stand up sup surfing, surfing to be in the Olympics. I will say, um, you know, I had the experience of, seeing SUP in the Pan American Games. And, you know, it was the first time, I'd like to make it clear, and, it's, and for those that don't know about the Pan American Games, it's similar to the Commonwealth Games, where it's a multi-sport event that has many different uh, uh, sports in it. And surfing, SUP wasn't in the Pan American Games. Surfing got into the Pan American Games. But under the surfing umbrella was shortboard, longboard, SUP surfing, and SUP racing. So I think, we have to step back for a moment and realize that SUP did not get into the Pan American Games, which as it, as it is now is the highest level that SUP has been in as far as on an Olympic kind of caliber scale. It was a part of the surfing you know, program. And so that in and of itself was awesome, but we, you know, kayak, that was the first time surfing's been in the Pan American Games and surfing brought stand up paddling racing and surfing with it. And I think that's really awesome. Kayaking has been in the Pan American Games for many years previously, and they have never brought surfing into the, or excuse me, stand up along with them into the Pan American Games. So that says something. And I'm not like, you know, one organization or the other. I think we're so young in this, as a sport. So I'm not trying to condemn one and praise the other. Although I work for ISA, I have an open mind and I'm my own person with my own thoughts, right? I think that ISA, I'm thankful that they brought SUP because I'll tell you what, man, it was so cool, you know, and I got to, I got to set up the course and I want to have the course like where it's going to highlight the wave component of it. And there was a lot of flack for like, oh, it shouldn't be in the waves and people wanted it to move, be moved to another venue and all this stuff and letters were written and I had to, you know, I went to Peru. I flew to Peru for 24 hours to go sit in meetings and you know, there's all these back end things that you do, right? To try and of like course, yeah. go look at other go and look at other venues. And at the end of the day, what happened was Connor caught this wave and there's all surfers in the background. And no one's surfers haven't really seen a real sup race in in the waves. And like he surfed this right on, you know, this Punta Rocas wave and everyone's like, whoa. And you know, it was a it was a cool thing for our sport. And what has happened to the Peruvian athletes within their own country. You know, Itzel and, and Vanya, who won medals um, in, in their respective, uh, uh, and also Tamil Martino. But 
uh, you know, it, it's done wonders for them. They were, you know, paraded onto the national stadium as medalists, um, you know, which was great for our sport. And so I think there's, we're so young, there's, there's, there's no hurry in my opinion, because we still don't even know where we're at. And I still don't think we have our act together as far as like how to put on an, a, a, an Olympic style uh, event. And, you know, I help put on events and I just, I don't think we're ready. And again, I ask people all the time, well, what would you do? And most people are like, uh, uh, they don't, you know, they don't have an answer. Um, and nor do I, but I think whatever's going to be exciting, I think that's where we should, we should go. And, and I, I, I do think that having these, like you said, a 20 kilometer distance race can be super exciting because there's so many different components to those rate to those races, like in a marathon race, that's, you know, three hours long, but there's like so many different parts to it and the biking races. Um, and so I, I would love to see if somebody asked me, Hey, Anthony, IOC, boom, you're in charge. Or I have this dream that like Apple computers gives me a hundred million dollars to run a racing tour. Right. And I, I thought a lot about this tour that I would run. I'm, I'm having that dream now too. <laughs> <laughs> With an infinite amount of money. Right. Can you imagine like, all the athletes are taken care of. Like we got your boards covered. You just show up, your board's ready. And what yeah. venues, you know, what I, what I run at and what events would I have? And, you know, I like all the disciplines. I love a 200 meter sprint in flat water. I love a 200 meter sprint out and back. In Australia, they have those dash for cash races where you start out the back, race to the beach. Those are rad. I love distance races because all of the strategy involved. I love, re you know, I, I think, we don't want to pigeon our whole ourselves into one style of, of, of racing. Um, and this is just me, me personally, I'm not speaking for ISA or any organization. This is just my own thoughts. And, and so, yeah, long winded answer. Cause it's, there's so much involved. <laughs> oh, totally. And then my next question was being, does that, does the sport really need the Olympics? Like can the sport flourish without the Olympics? Because it's sort of done that at a very elementary level so far. And there's, there's so much going on with different events, like the manufacturers, as you say, have held up the sport for a long time. There's different organizations like the, the Euro Tour and the APP, and there's like the WPA, I think, for a while. And you sort of have all these different um, events and organizations like seeing value in the sport and putting time and effort into it. Like something like, I say, like they say something, you work with the APP as well, and you're sort of running world championships events, and then the ISA runs a world championship event, and then the ICF runs a world championship event. Is that is that a negative or is that a positive for the sport? Because then they're all competing against each other to bring the sport up and that gives everyone a platform, but does it actually help the sport at a grassroots level? Like, is it helping more juniors getting into the sport? Is it setting up coaching programs and clubs and, and different things that are actually going to create sustainability for the sport, not just putting it on a global stage at the Olympics and going, Oh, here's what we do. Um, sometimes in one certain section of, of a sport that has so many different elements, you know, like, I don't know, I, I'm sort of on the fence about the Olympic scene. Sure, like, I think it would be great to bring the sport to more people, but is it going to be that significant or is it going to be on like 2 a.m. on a Thursday night when the Olympics is <laughs> on anyway, when no one really watches it? And then you get, you might, you might actually get a medal and then you might get a, a TV show for a one hour and then you're back to work next, on the next Monday. So it's, it's, isn't it that significant that? all the time and energy of a lot of these organizations are getting focused on it or should we be focusing more on like like the states or, or the county races and then the the, the state races then the, the national races and then going to the inter, inter like you know like building it up that way it just feels like it's like oh well, we want it in the olympics and it's like well well yeah as you said like what is the sport like is it i don't know it wasn't it like a thing like i'm I, I'm, the, I'm totally unbiased about this thing i just want the sport to get better so it's like you guys yeah. have like um it propels you with a paddle forward. So it's, it's kayaking and then surf, ISA is like it's surfing. And then that's the part, part of the argument or something. I don't know why we don't hear what happens inside the courtrooms, but it just seems like there's just all this noise going on. It's like, but that isn't making the sport bigger. Like, you're not like, like where are the federations in each and every country, like setting up like programs, setting up like um, high performance training centers, setting up like all these type of things. And is it, is it the Olympics, the focus just because, all of a sudden you may get money to get grants to get medals, which may support these programs. Is that the, the whole goal? Like what is the goal? Man, that's, that's, you know, it's like, it's a great point and a great question. And, you know, it's like surfing for a lot of years, you know, people would say the same thing you said, does surfing need the Olympics? 
And, um, you know, I think the answer for a long time was, you know, or even still now is, is no, it doesn't really need the Olympics. And I think it's great for the athletes to, you know, be able to represent their country. And that's, you know, kind of something cool and to, you know, walk out in the opening ceremonies and there's, you know, some cool aspects of it, but, um, you know, for a sport, like you said, that like might get shown at, you know, two in the morning, like how will it help the individual athletes? But furthermore, how will it help the development of the sport? By having a sport in the Olympics, does that necessarily mean that someone's going to see it and be like, I want to be a stand-up paddler? Or is it they see somebody who they respect in their community doing it and say, wow, that looks like fun. Or they get involved in a local race and their family brings them in. Oh, that's, you know, that's fun. So, you know, I think that a lot of things need to, need to happen in our sport for it to be sustainable. And one of, one of the biggest things that I, you know, bring up all the time to as often as I can is just that, you know, we need non-endemic sponsors to become part of the sport. We need money in the sport, basically, right? And the money can't come from the endemic brands. It has to come from outside of the industry. And, you know, like what you've, you know, done with, with the, um, you know, race tour that you and Sean partners and Dean, you guys were um, working on and, you know, I'm not sure where it is with all that's going on, but like to have these, these people that love paddling and it's changed their life that also, you know, work for these companies to see the value in using their marketing dollars towards something that helps a pause helps positively in a sport helps promote healthy lifestyle. Cause on a bigger scale, like that's really what sport is all about is like keeping us all healthier so we can live better lives. Right. So I think that creating an environment where not everyone's going to go to the Olympics, not everyone's going to do the APP, the ISA, the ICF, but we can all paddle to be healthier, to have a better life, to be able to run around with our kids better, to not get have some of these underlying conditions that can, that are causes for people, you know, passing away from the virus that's going around right now. So in my opinion, like sport is to keep us healthy so we can be healthier for our families and just live a better life. So this is why I have this dream of Apple computers and other non-endemic brands jumping into our sport, helping put good money into the sport and not taking from the brands and not relying on the athletes to spend their hard-earned dollars to get their boards to all these events and all these different things. And so I think it has it's like a bookend sort of thing, right? Yeah, it's great to have these world championship style of events and it's great to see you know the Michael Booths and the you know the Kyle Lennies and you know all these you know the Poinike Rioja is doing what he does on surf and to see what you do in racing in all different conditions and um, you know the fact that Connor's done great in 200 meter sprints in Germany and other places and he's won Molokai and everywhere in between our sports like no other sport where you've got to be challenged you've got to go race in a pool in France and you've got to race in the Carolina cup. Right. So you yeah. you're, we're being asked, not we, cause I don't do it, but you're being asked to do so many different uh, parts of the sport. It's a, it's a tough ask to train in all those ways. And, you know, you've, I think done well to realize, Hey, well, you know, yeah, you're winning races, but you're also doing a lot for the sport, not just for monetarily monetary reasons. That's great. But I truly believe that you have a, vested interest in in the sport just in the sustainability of it and that's one of the things that you know we've had you know a few chats i cherish you know we had the one chat in new york and i was like man this guy's really cool and it's been you know just cool to see the way that you're doing things but i feel we need non-endemic dollars i feel you need the local uh, uh organizations whatever those are to to step up we don't have that really um you know in in our area uh for example we have different, you know, there's Surfing America that's in charge. And then there's the Eastern Surfing Association. They have, in, they have SUP surfing in their events. There's the Hawaiian Surfing Association. They have SUP in their events. There's the Western Surfing Association. They want nothing to do with SUP. It's a short board, you know, in California, you know, the only yeah. place where you can not go SUP in places. Like, there's still this stigma. So, like, how do we, how do we beat that? Well, you just beat it with, like, good intentions and you beat it with, having local events where people get stoked on the sport. You beat it with having access to equipment. That's a big thing in our sport. Like in Surf Life Saving in Australia, you have these surf clubs where kids have access to the equipment so they can fall in love with it. 
I think our sport is way too young and the disparity between the countries and access to equipment is huge. And, you know, we go to these ISA events and there's, you know, a handful of countries that have more access. So the athletes are better. And then there's like this big gap between the top end of the pack and the bottom end of the pack. How do we bridge that gap? So if we get to the Olympics, the sport's actually like competitive, you know, and not just a few people. So it's like, we need the bookend effect. We need people like yourselves who, you know, you're, you're talking about, you want to start putting on events later, but you know, you're actually doing it now. And we need people that are doing it at the local level. We need the organizations to set up, get set up more. We need standardization, not necessarily standardization, but organization of have teaching people the right way, how to train, how to, you know, coach people, how to do all those things. And, you know, uh, honestly, like it takes money, whether it comes from the international federations or whether it comes from uh, businesses that, that, you know, people that are in charge of marketing dollars have fallen in love with the sport. And, you know, we've had that, uh, you know, happen in certain companies and, you know, in our, our area and things. But I feel like there are people and the more people that get into the sport, it's one of those things, whatever you're paddling, you know, ski, canoe, you know, sup, like it's all awesome being on the water and somewhere there's people, you know, with the money that want to like give the money to, and it's like such a great spend for marketing. I feel like, you know, maybe you don't get like the huge, you know, return off the investment or it's hard to really gauge, but if you're a paddler and you love paddling, you know, why would you not want to help support the sport of paddling? And it's cool to see, and I'm thankful for the companies that do. So um, we're, we're so young. Do we need, do we need the Olympics? Uh, in, in my opinion, at this point, I don't think so. It would be great to have that kind of here, but I don't think that dangling that carrot, you know, around the sport is, is uh, I don't necessarily want to use them, those terms, but I don't think that's the end all be all of, of the sport. It, we're, we, yeah. we need a lot more for the sport to continue to grow. The only thing that something like the Olympics could do is help streamline a lot of different organizational processes in different countries that could actually help benefit the sport. That's the only thing that I see it like the sport runs itself already by itself more or less but if you've got like some sort of carrot as you say dangling above everybody and going well this you've got to get your shit together quickly because yeah. <laughs> in eight years or 12 years or 20 years time or whatever it is this is going to happen so you need to start putting things in place and you sort of see sports that in even in australia here that just get held up by being an olympic sport like if they were an olympic sport nobody would do it but because it's an olympic sport it's like oh well, we're going to do that because it's an olympic sport and there's 10 of us that do it and we get funded so we'll go and do it and then the sport doesn't really exist apart from that which is right. quite interesting when you have something like stand up paddling which kind of everybody like well, not everybody but a hell of a lot of people have paddled a stand up paddleboard and that's something that's very special about the sport because it is so accessible like you go down to your local boating camping store and you can buy a stand up for 200 bucks and <laughs> it gradually works through your, the process and you, and you end up eventually buying your, your top of the range board for I don't know how much they cost like four grand these <laughs> days depending on which country you're in but it's there's this like that top down structure that can really be sustainable I think and you're sort of looking at different markets around the world at the moment like with the brands doing quite well because of this individual focus of something like stand up paddling so people are looking for recreational activities they can do by themselves they're not getting involved they're not touching other people and you're yeah. sort of seeing like i've spoken to people in like the uk and in like europe and america and in asia and, and they're all doing really well like obviously crazy times when the pandemic hit but now it's it's kind of booming and a lot of things are selling out which is <laughs> exciting and but we can't go enjoy it maybe not for another <laughs> <laughs> two years in race you know like so it's, yeah. it's going to be a very interesting view for this next like sort of five to ten years and seeing how the sport develops but yeah you can just sort of talk all day about this stuff but it's, it's good to sort of put it on a platform and just talk about it openly and just trying to get more people talking about it and just seeing how um we can make prog progress without being on facebook and, and just going being angry at everybody i see that a lot and i'm just like well let's let's try and make constructive criticism that we can actually use to to move forward yeah and just, you know, do something, right? Like, like a lot of people, you know, as a race director and involved consulting on a lot of races, you know, I got, a, I get a lot of emails about you should have done this. Why wasn't this age group or that age group or this or that? And, you know, my response, I don't necessarily say it to these people, but to, you know, others, maybe like I have a committee and I'm like, it's always like, 
you put on a race then, right? So like you put your, you know, effort and money where your, where your mouth is and you want all this stuff. Okay. You organize a race. And that's, you know, I think really what we need is like people, you know, that just don't just want to talk, but they want to do. And, you know, like last, last year I was like, you know, I run this business in the Harbor and Dana point and I'm traveling to all these races and I've seen races decline in California. And I'm like, Oh, why don't I put on a race? And, you know, so I put on a, a local event and, you know, I was going to be stoked to have, you know, 75 people and, you know, ordered, you know, 120 shirts or something. And, you know, next thing you know, we had 160 people. And cause I didn't really understand how much people were thriving on it, but I also tried to create an environment that for, for new paddlers. And I was proud that we had 42 people that have never been in a race before, you know, and helped provide boards and it's access to equipment and things like that. And I work on another event for the world world wildlife fund. And last year uh, in the second year of the event, we have it in San Diego. We had 272 paddlers of those 272 paddlers, 120 of them didn't even have a board or paddle. And we had, you know, rental shops, bring them down and stuff, but like, getting people on the water. This is, this is how you do it, right? You want to complain about races, whatever, like you do your race, you put on a race and see how it is and all the effort that goes into it. And you'll have a better understanding of like, no one's making money from putting on events, right? People are doing it because they're passionate about it. If you think people are making money, you're, you're wrong. And they're actually losing money, you know, for the most part, trying to help create something because they're passionate about it. But I mean, I mean, that's, it's what it takes. And it doesn't have to be a huge thing. Do, do a weekly race league for three weeks or four weeks or do it, just do something. That's all you, that's all we need to do is like little things go a long way. And if a bunch of people all over the world are, you know, okay, for every other week for six weeks in the summer, we're going to do a race and, you know, have the kids at school make a little award. And like, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. And that's the part that's like, you know, keep it simple and keep it fun and i think yeah. that's what's gonna keep drawing people into the sport yeah it's, and it's just all about just doing something like it's always <laughs> there's always a million things out there that you can do and it's just like oh we'll just start just go and so i always <laughs> say to people who have coaching and that type of thing it's like well like when you start your session just get out there and paddle just paddle five minutes and then start your session because until you get to the water and start, you just you can make so many decisions where you're not going to actually get on the water and start. Like this morning, it was like rainy and windy and terrible. And I was like, oh, I am not getting out of bed. And I was like, but I told people I was going paddling this morning with them. So I have to go. And then when we get there, I'm like, I don't really want, still don't really want to paddle. You sit in your warm car and you're like, should I get on the water? You're like, I've got no goals coming up. I was like, I, I told people I was going to paddle. So then you go and start. Yeah, yeah. That's, how, that's how all good things happen. You just got to get going, not think about it for too long. But, um, mate, is there any, um, anything else coming up on the horizon for you? Like, there's obviously, we spoke about so many things today, but, like, I know you obviously love your surf life saving. You're, you're doing a lot of good things around the paddling community with um, directing races, being involved with so many different organizations, creating events, doing a lot for the stand-up paddling community. But, like, towards the end of, of 2020 into early 2021, have you got any plans? Can, you, can we make any plans um, going with this pandemic? Or is it just about just keeping trying to reinvent yourself and trying to do new things to sort of keep the, the family afloat and just enjoy everything that you can do right now. It's so hard to like plan for anything right now. And, you know, I'm just really enjoying like, you know, being home with Michelle and Athena. I've got a daughter that's, you know, almost going to be turning two in October. And, you know, these, these special times at home that, um, you know, she was born in October of 2018. And then, you know, three weeks later, I was flying to China and for the ISA and, you know, I was like seeing a twinkle, twinkle little star right before the race director's meeting, you know, and, and it was um, literally, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's a unique time that, you know, I feel, I feel like it's one of those, like you're looking for the, you know, the blessing in disguise kind of thing. And that's what it is and trying to, you know, reinvent um, for, for me and, and, you know, I think, um, uh, I just would love to get, you know, back to like getting somewhat fit, trying to keep fitness level up is, is hard when you're doing lots of other things and family and, you know, trying to work and stuff. And, um, that's why I reached out to you, you know, to get some coaching because, you know, of, of, of just, you know, like 
I respect a lot of that you're doing. And, you know, uh, like, you know, I help people, but like, sometimes you just want to be told what to do. Like, give me, just tell me what to do. And, 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 you know, I'll go yeah. do it. And I did pretty good for a few weeks and, and, uh, you know, I was working towards this event, but I really, I, I want to be coached, you know, I, I miss that part. I miss getting out and, and training hard. And so it was, it was just really awesome to get the, you know, the, the programs you were sending and to go out and, you know, I did the virtual Molokai and got to like put myself out there again and go hard and be tired. And, um, you know, I would, I would love to get back to figure out a way to be disciplined enough to, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I'm in the participatory stage, right. I don't have any, you know, uh, uh, delusions of grandeur or anything, but I like having a good old fashioned hit out. So, you know, when the time comes where there's some events and it's hard cause I work at a lot of the events that I want to, that I want to race in. Um, but you know, like Molokai is always kind of on the, on the back of my mind. Um, it's an expensive event, so it's not like you can do it every year. Um, you know, I have some friends, clients that, you know, have helped out with, you know, miles and stuff to get me there and, you know, hotels. And, um, so thanks to, you know, the Weeks family. Um, but that's always like, you know, I did it, I did it paddleboard solo. I, um, I did it as a team, you know, with my friend Jonas. And then I did it in 2018, virtually like off the couch, because um, that's when we were going through a lot of the cancer stuff. And that year turned out to be a terror. I'm just like, oh, I'll just surf the whole way, you know, and it turned out to be a terrible year to do it. And like, you know, but I, 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 I made it and it was like such a, there's a lot of things that happen within that race mentally, like in any of those races. And I would really love to do Molokai one year where I'm actually fit and we have good conditions and like. And this is a race that, you know, I don't think I'll ever work on, right? So, like, in reality, that's kind of an event that I I don't know if it's 2021 or 2022 or when it is, yeah. but I have that that event in particular in my mind. And I'm not going to go out and win it or anything, but, like, I'd like to at least just see how I can do. And, you know, I have kind of a goal time in mind, you know, that if if I'm fit and if we have good conditions that I feel like I can get to and obviously doing some other smaller local races and leading up to it. But my goal, man, is just like I was saying, just to like be a little healthier in my life, you know, turns out, I don't know if you knew this, but if you don't eat right and you drink beer and you don't exercise, you don't lose weight or get fit. I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> so yeah, it just I'd like to, <laughs> so I'd like to, you know, get to the point where I can actually make the, uh, finish the three rounds of the dry land workouts that you said that you send out or not have or not have to like break the planks when um you know i'm supposed to be doing two minutes but i can only do a minute it's called, it's called consistency it is yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's that's my goal though i'd love to get back to like you know a level of fitness that you know maybe not like i ever was but just to where i'm just healthier and you know feel good about myself and you know that's i think that's what we all want to do is just be a little bit healthier. So um, that's what's upcoming for me, hopefully, is just kind of like I've had a couple of events finish and, you know, I'm, I'm starting like this end of the year stage. And um, so I just want to like get a little fit, get a little more fit. Yeah, for sure. Well, like I guess it's for everybody at the moment, it's just about trying to stay fit and healthy and, and trying to stay mentally strong as well with all the stuff going on. Like I find now, like I basically just paddle for, for life and for fitness and whatever it is and, and go, cause I enjoy it so much, but there's not really, um, yeah, there's nothing really to, to plan for or anything like that. So you got to find, you got to pick, you got to pick your, uh, you pick your battles and if there's not many battles coming up. You just got to find something to do. And going on a few yeah. surfing trips coming up as well now, cause I guess there's nothing to plan for. So now I can, plans to do stuff whereas before it was like sean partners race week was probably going to happen so i was like really like sort of getting set for that to make sure that i was fit and ready for that and then obviously like app and like carolina and i was like looking at it now and like it, like i think the prime minister came out the other day or our, our president equivalent sort of came out and was like oh we don't think we're going to open the borders until at least next year and i was like oh 2020 right off of yeah next <laughs> next year so it's it's kind of it's kind of good almost that you don't like you don't have anything to plan for because before it was like you don't know if you don't have anything to plan for you like it's it's yeah it's a really weird situation but i guess everyone's got to deal with it and we're all dealing with it and in our own different ways but um mate thanks so much for coming on i really appreciate that chat and i enjoyed sort of diving into a bit more about av and, and finding out a little bit more about uh 
uh, how, how you're sort of going to help build the sport going forward. I sort of going to put all the whole sports on your shoulders. <laughs> well, I'm putting it back on your shoulders. No, I, I appreciate the time and I appreciate, you know, the, the, you know, all the different, you know, uh, people that you've, that you've had on, I've gotten to watch, you know, several, and I, you know, I can't wait to dive in, dive into more of them, but, um, you know, I think it's, you come from a unique background of lots of, you know, different sports and you've, you've touched on so many different, um, aspects of, you know, sport and success and, and, and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, I just, uh, it's, it's an honor and I'm stoked to chat with you and thanks for all that, that you're doing, um, you know, keeping people healthy and keeping the sport going and, um, you know, we need more people like you doing positive things. And I think we're headed in a, in a good direction. So very much appreciated, Michael. Mate, appreciate the kind words. And just in wrapping up, if you want to watch or listen to any of these, um, please check out uh, Boothcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or um, any of those special podcast channels that are out there as well. Uh, if you want to watch any of these, please check out Facebook Watch on my Michael Booth channel. And I'll be sort of talking to a lot of different people coming up soon. So stay tuned.